Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you again for being with us this evening and reporting that we've diagnosed an additional 386 new cases of COVID-19, bringing the total number now diagnosed in this country to 19,648, 19648. I'm also reporting an additional 18 new deaths that have been notified to us in the last 24 hours, bringing the total notified to 1,102. In terms of a detailed analysis of 903 laboratory confirmed cases, uh, 431 or 48% of those have been hospitalized, uh, 56 or 6.2% uh, in an intensive care unit, uh, 778 uh, were associated with an underlying condition, uh, that's 86%. The male female breakdown of those deaths was 477 to 426, that's 53 to 47 percent. The median age is 83 and the mean age is 81 of, of all those deaths. In terms of a detailed breakdown of all incident cases notified up to Saturday the 25th of April, the night before last, uh, there were a total of 19,095, 19095. 2,625 had been hospitalized, that's 13.7 percent, again a small drop in percentage. 353 had been admitted to intensive care, that's 1.8 percent, also a small drop in terms of the percentage. 27 percent are healthcare workers, the median age of all of those incident cases is 49 and the male female breakdown is 42 to 57 percent. In terms of 357 ICU admissions, uh, 146 of those uh, are remaining in an intensive care unit, that's 41 per cent. We've now had 154 discharges in total from intensive care, that's 43 per cent. Uh, as I've said, 56 deaths took place in an intensive care unit, that's a, a percentage of 15.7 of all intensive care unit admissions. 295 of the intensive care unit admissions have reports of underlying illnesses, that's 83%, and the median age of those admissions to intensive care is 60. In terms of a more detailed breakdown of clusters and cases in community residential facilities and nursing homes, we now have 355 uh, clusters reported in, in association with community residential facilities, 211 of which are in nursing homes. There are 3,875 3, notified cases in association with those 355 community residential facilities, 3,048, 3,048 in association with uh, nursing homes. Uh, in relation to those cases that were admitted to hospital, so of all community and residential facilities, 317 of those, case, of those cases were admitted to hospital, that's 88.1% of the 3,875. Uh, and in respect of nursing homes, 213 people have been admitted to hospitals, that's 7% of the figure of 3048 I gave you for all incident cases associated with nursing homes. In terms of deaths uh, in these settings, uh, a total of 641 uh, associated with, uh, more t with community residential facilities, 546 of which are in respect of nursing homes. That's 58% of, of the total number of deaths uh, are in association with community residential facilities, 49.5% in respect of those uh, arising uh, for residents of nursing homes. To give you the breakdown of laboratory confirmed and probable in respect of community residential facilities, Laboratory confirm, confirmation accounts for 500 of the 641, with then probables making up the remaining 141 uh, deaths in association with community residential facilities. And then in respect of nursing homes, uh, laboratory confirmation accounts for 420 of the 546 deaths, with 126 making up the balance accounted for by probable uh, deaths. Uh, in respect of the deaths that occurred in a hospital environment. So of all those people arising, deaths arising for residents of community residential facilities and nursing homes, those that took place in a hospital have not changed, those numbers have not changed since the numbers I gave you on Friday. But to just give them again, uh, in respect of laboratory confirmation, 
109 uh, occurred in a hospital environment uh, out of a total of 115 in association with community residential facilities. Uh, and the figure for nursing homes is 91 lab laboratory confirm confirmed deaths arising for nursing home residents taking place in hospital environment out of a total of 95 such deaths. So we're happy to take any questions that you might have now. Richard. Tony Richard Chambers from Virgin Media News. We're now just over a week away from May the 5th. Could you tell us specifically what are the main issues or serious concerns you would have that would give you pause uh, from easing any restrictions or lifting any restrictions around that time? Yeah, I think I was saying towards the end of last week that if the assessment was being made in any of the, the days I was with you towards the end of last week that we wouldn't be recommending uh, that we'd arrived at a point where we'd be, we'd be lifting those restrictions and if anything, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more, fir more firmly of that view, uh, given what we're seeing. We've seen a continued s small, although persistent, uh, admission rate to intensive care units. So we're seeing half a dozen or so cases being admitted to intensive care units each day. And while we're seeing discharges from those uh, units happening at roughly the same rate, we have, we have uh, something in the order of 130, 140 at any point in time, and the drop in that number has slowed down in terms of the total number of people in an intensive care unit. And so just to dwell on that and to remind you, uh, and I won't give you the precise figures, because, uh, but if you recall the second set of measures that we introduced, and then the third set of measures by way of restrictions, which are both introduced in the same week, we went from something around 35, approximately, ICU admissions during, or ICU beds occupied uh, uh, for, the, for that second set of measures, and that roughly doubled over the course of that week. Uh, and we're at, something in the region of 130, 140 now, so it's a much higher number. We'd like to see that number come down. Uh, we're still reporting a significant number of cases. Uh, we still have a significant challenge in terms of the numbers of healthcare facilities, particularly community residential facilities that are reporting cases, and we'd like to see further improvement in all of those indicators. Uh, we're hopeful that as the week goes on, there's still seven days left to the 5th of, of May, uh, we're hopeful that we'll continue to see improvements in terms of the experience, but there's still, there's still a way to go. Currently, stand to see any major easing at this so, point. So the trends, the trends have been encouraging, uh, but we need to see further progress uh, to satisfy ourselves that we've arrived at a point. You will be aware that there are countries contemplating and have already introduced easing in, in relation to the restrictions, and have done so when they've gotten to much lower figures than some of the figures that we're still experiencing in this country, by way of either the incidence of the disease, in other words, the number of new cases occurring either in the population generally or perhaps in nursing home and community residential facility type environments, or the impact of the disease. In other words, the numbers of people being admitted to intensive care and the numbers of people being hospitalized. So while those numbers have improved, they're still big numbers, relatively speaking. It still accounts for roughly half of what was our standing ICU capacity at the start of all of this. There has been great work done in the HSC to greatly increase that capacity, but we have roughly um, 250 or so, uh, maybe 300, uh, ICU beds when, before all this began. We're at about 50% of that at the moment. We need to see significant reduction in those kinds of figures over the course of the week. Uh, we're hopeful that will happen and we'll continue to report, but uh, that's my sense of where things are at just at the moment. In terms of nursing homes then and long-term residential care settings, I asked you about two weeks ago about the guidelines issued or any advice issued in terms of visitor restrictions. Have you any thought about whether or not that was the advice that was given was good enough? Was it strong enough to nursing homes and other settings? Uh, so we, we have, and there has been public comment on this, we, we made recommendations in relation to nursing homes that were not specifically focused on nursing homes uh, in that week of around the 10th, 11th, 12th of March. Uh, at that point, we hadn't done any cases in nursing homes. I think there were two clusters of infection in the country at that time, uh, and they were both in association with hospitals. We were at quite an early stage in the disease, and if I might remind you, over the course of that week, we saw a number of things happen. This is now before we had introduced or recommended the first set of restrictions. Uh, some schools were starting to close of their own volition. Uh, some organisations that were, you know, uh, um, uh, non-healthcare-related organisations were taking their own steps to introduce measures, uh, and there had been uh, some uh, uh, recommendations in relation to nursing home visitation. What we were anxious to do at that point in time was to say, all of these measures make sense, but doing them in an organized and coherent way and doing it at the right time is what we want to achieve. We introduced those, uh, uh, in fact, later that week, 
Uh, I recall that we met late on the evening of the 11th, and, and you recall, into the night, uh, and came with a set of recommendations that ultimately were announced by the Taoiseach early on the morning of the 12th, when he was in the United States. Uh, and that was quite soon after that point, and I do have a graph which I can show, um, if I can skip forward to it. You've seen this before, you may not recall, but this one here shows you the, the blue, which is the experience of incident infection in the population in general, so that's the epidemic curve, if you like, in the general population. The red shows you the, the spread of this infection through nursing homes. Uh, there's at least, for the most part, a 10, two-day, or a two-week lag between the two. Uh, the, the date that we're referring to, the 12th of March, is, is you can see there, a couple of days uh, before the 14th, uh, well below or well, well prior to this infection uh, commencing in the nursing home sector. And there was at least an incubation period experienced uh, after that point before we began to see any significant infection or any clusters being reported in that particular sector. So we don't think that the measure in terms of restricting visiting in nursing homes was introduced uh, too late, although that's been suggested, and I'm aware that that's been suggested. We were really conscious with a measure like this, given the social impact that it has, and we would have explained this at the time. Important that it's not introduced too early, that people have to suffer for too long with it, and indeed that it's not lifted too early. We were talking about this here last week. Uh, we don't believe now is the time for lifting a measure like that because of the experience that is currently being had in, in nursing homes. So just to make that point, um, Siobhan, did you want to have... I was just going to comment that we didn't want to introduce restrictions too early because of how draconian and how difficult they are for people and how very, very distressing it is for anybody not to be able to have contact with their family member. We really do appreciate that and do understand it. So restricting visiting in any sort of a healthcare setting, be it hospital, be it a nursing home, we were very conscious of how difficult that is for people who are living in those facilities or who may be patients in a hospital. More questions. It's just something which has been raised by a number of our viewers, just in terms of after May the 5th, small family gatherings, one actual particular instance that people keep raising is the question of weddings this year, in terms of even further on down beyond the summer and September. Surely, given the advice around social gatherings, mass gatherings, there would be a very, there would surely be a public health difficulty in holding weddings of any sort of Irish variety in terms of size at, at this point in time. So look, we will give appropriate and clear advice in relation to all of those things at the right time. We're giving consideration right at the moment to a range of different measures and you know, not just weddings but social gatherings of all kinds in terms of scale uh, will be part of, let's say, the framework of things that we're, we're looking at. Uh, we're working, as I've said before, on a cross-government basis to try to identify in a situation where we feel that, firstly, the disease characteristics, which we've already gone through, are at a level that we think it's appropriate to start thinking about lifting restrictions and secondly, that are the requirements which we've talked about before in terms of testing and sampling and most importantly in terms of contact trace, tracing and management of, of contacts is at the level that we need it to be at. When those requirements are satisfied, we think we'll be in a position to recommend changes in terms of those restrictions and I'm not going to get into speculating exactly which ones, but we are very sensitive uh, to the fact that these are having a big impact on the population. Some of these measures are very difficult for people. We, we recognize that. It's been really challenging for people to, to work with them we've made great progress in working with them. We understand that there has been, uh, if you like, a frustration evident growing. We see it every day. We've presented some of that hard information to you that shows that we are starting to see behavior arising that, of a kind that isn't uh, the kind that we want to see. Um, and we want to encourage people to continue to work with us to make as much progress as we can in driving down some of those indicators I spoke to you about at the beginning of your questions and to get it as far as we possibly can get for the 5th of May. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Stephen McDermott with the journal.ie. Um, just a couple of questions. First of all, uh, does reports in the UK of a multi-system inflammatory syndrome affecting children, this is uh, apparently a note from a doctor in Ireland uh, has gone viral reporting similar here. I've been wondering if there's any reports of this or... I'm not aware of that. I'm, no, I'm not aware of that. If you have some details, I can have that checked out. Um, but there's, no, but there's no inflammatory syndrome affecting children in association with COVID-19. I mean, you know. so, so some of the mechanisms through which, uh, let's say, the, the impact of this illness is mediated is by a significant impact, in, in, inflammatory impact. Uh, but the more severe infection is, 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 is in older people and adults. Uh, I'm not aware of those particular reports in respect of children. Uh, we haven't seen no, a profile of infection uh, impacting severe illness uh, arising in children in, in this country. Okay. Uh, 
On Friday, you gave an update of the number of healthcare workers affected by COVID-19 in Ireland. Um, I'm wondering, do you have updated figures for as of last Saturday midnight? Or? So we'll present that later in the week. So the, the, those reports are only run through this week, and then we'll present them on Wednesday or Thursday of this week. Okay. Um, there's been some talk about the transparency of the National Public Health Emergency Team um, and meeting notes and minutes. Um, from what I saw, the last updated minutes were at the end of March. Um, I'm wondering when we can expect uh, further notes or minutes being updated. Uh, a little later this week. Uh, so the explanation for that is a fairly simple one. Uh, it's a huge exercise. I got to say some of this here last week. Um, it meets twice a week, a four-hour meeting. It's a huge job for the Secretariat of that to turn around minutes. And there has been a bit of a logjam, including some of them sitting on my desk for the purpose of being cleared. It's just a workload issue uh, and trying to prioritise it as much as possible. We're committed to the principle of transparency. What has to happen now is some of those sets of minutes which are written need to be circulated and discussed at the, at the regular meeting as would be normal course with any committee and approved for publication when we meet again tomorrow. And so I'd expect, assuming that the NEFIT is in a position to approve those minutes, that they'd be published after that point in time. It's nothing, uh, no, no, no resiling from or lack of commitment to the principle of clear transparency. We set up this whole process at the very beginning on the basis of publishing agendas and minutes and as much in the way of our public deliberations as we could. We present ourselves to you here every evening uh, to answer the questions that you have as best we possibly can. And when there are things that we either don't know or can't tell you for whatever reason, we're, we try to be as clear as we possibly can about that. Um, so we expect to be in a position to publish those minutes later this week. And as I say, it is a workload issue. And in some circumstances in relation to that workload, mea culpa in terms of uh, getting some of those things uh, processed. OK, just one final one for me. Uh, there's been talk today about uh, visitation at cemeteries, which has obviously been an issue in the north. Um, could you just outline under the current guidance or the current guidelines uh, whether it's OK for people to visit their loved ones in cemeteries? Uh, so we, we have uh, public health advice here uh, in relation to what are appropriate and uh, recommended activities. We try to limit those activities as, in as much as we possibly can, and we've been clear in what they are. We're continuing to engage. We're aware of that, uh, let's say, change or, or, or development in relation to Northern Ireland. We're continuing to engage on a daily basis with colleagues on a cross-border basis. If we think we're in a position to make any change to our guidance, we'll be very clear about that as we get towards the end of this week. I'm not going to say anything different now in terms of so our current guidance, the exceptions that we set for people, the circumstances which we think it's okay for people to go out, we've set those out already in terms of, um, because our, our basic message for people now is to stay at home and to stay at home as much as you possibly can uh, for reasons of your own protection and for reasons of, of ensuring that we can limit in as much as we can the transmission of this virus. So you would recommend against visiting a cemetery? So it's not on the list of, of exceptions that we've currently identified. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi, sure. Tony. Uh, Shane Beatty from News Talk. Um, I think it's pretty clear from what you've been saying that if, obviously if the restrictions were due to be lifted today, you'd be recommending they're not lifted. I'm just wondering, have you made your mind up? You don't have to tell us either way, but have you actually made your mind up or is this down to the wire on Friday? Uh, it is down to the wire, um, uh, and so I haven't made my mind up. And I, I might be the chair of a process, but I'm only one vo voice in it. We have many different voices. Uh, we'll have a discussion tomorrow. Uh, we'll talk further about the kinds of measures that are important for us to, to, uh, to look at and the levels in relation to those measures. And we'll, we'll seek to wait as long as possible before applying those measures, which is what we've always done. Um, and also say that we're prepared to change our minds, so even if we have our minds made up on something. As I said to you, uh, uh, and I referred to it in, in, in Richard Chambers' questions earlier, in the week in March when we made two separate sets of recommendations, we came here on the Tuesday evening and there was public announcements around some of those on the Tuesday evening of that week. Uh, and I'm sure I would have said this, uh, and I would have certainly uh, been of the view that we wouldn't be back to you with another set of measures that week. Uh, and if you'd asked me, I would have said no. But of course, we came back and we had further things to do because, because something happened that we weren't anticipating. We always have to be ready watching uh, in the event that something happens that we're not anticipating uh, uh, and, and in a position to change our minds. So even if our minds are made up, uh, they're subject to change on the basis of what we see with the disease and what we see with the experience uh, that we monitor in terms of uh, uh, the impact of the various restrictions that are in place. Is it likely, because the, the criteria for um, the case definition for testing is changing this week, is it likely that we'll see a, a spike or an increase in the number of confirmed cases? Because you're talking about you want a very low incidence rate before we can do that. Are we likely to see a lot more cases 
uh, confirmed? Yeah, we could do. We have seen a lot of cases being confirmed in, in the last uh, week. Uh, that's been driven in a significant way by the numbers of people being diagnosed in the nursing home and community residential uh, sector sampling program that's underway at the moment, the testing program that's underway at the moment in, in the HSE. But there's still a background rate in the general population of infections. Uh, when we change the case definition during the course of this week, we will see more referrals, we'll see more testing, and I expect to see more cases arising from that, even if I think that the, the actual background rate of infection in the, in the community is low. Uh, I'd expect the positivity rate, if you like, the percentage to be low of those cases that are tested. Uh, but the will, that will lead to some level of increase, but we need to see that. We need to see that and experience what that change in case definition is over the course of this week. It was always one of the important preparatory steps, and we set it out for you before, to, to make these kinds of adjustments before we get to the 5th of May and to see what the impact is, because uh, if the impact leads to a much, much greater number of people coming forward for testing than, uh, than we might have anticipated, and even if we're not expecting that to be the case, uh, we need to be in a position to pick that up and to make any necessary adjustments arising from that. Just two final brief ones from me. We're seeing um, a high, um, or, or I suppose you call it Cavan and Monaghan, have been two of the counties worst affected. I'm just wondering, are you comfortable with the idea that you can come from the north into this country and the regulations or the restrictions don't apply to you? Uh, so what we're trying to do, and as much as we possibly can, is to work as closely with our colleagues in the north as we, as, as we can. Uh, we think on both sides of the island the experience of the disease is very similar. Uh, it's a little different, the experience of the disease across Great Britain, and the two islands, if you like, are behaving differently in terms of the experience of the disease. Uh, we think that uh, it's important for us to try and find a means of continuing to communicate and as much as we can coordinate in the way in which we might step back from some of the restrictions that are in place on both sides of the island. Uh, and we'll be looking to try and find a way of cooperating as much as we possi possibly can with, with colleagues on both sides of the islands working together to ensure that we don't have different measures applying to different um, uh, parts of the island. We want to see the same measures applying in as much as we reasonably can, like, because we're taking the same approach to our observations of the same disease at the same point in time, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, it does. And just finally, if we had an unlimited supply of masks, would you be recommending that people wear masks in public? Um, so the, the recommendations in relation to that isn't necessarily driven by supply. Uh, uh, and we understand that some people already are making some of those decisions and, de and determinations. Uh, we're looking at the evidence, where we're looking at the uh, guidance in relation to the use of these uh, devices uh, from the WHO and from ECDC and so on. Um, and we have to continue to emphasize to people that like, respiratory etiquette, in other words, masks and the use of them to prevent secretions uh, may, may be one part of your response. But hand washing, we think, is really important as well. And there is evidence and good reason to believe that if masks aren't worn properly, it can lead to contamination. People are touching masks that are contaminated. It can lead to contamination of hands. If you're not washing hands properly, that can then lead to spread of infection with this particular type of virus. We think that's an even more important way of spreading this virus than would arise with influenza. Uh, it can also sometimes lead to a false sense of security, the sense that if you wear a mask, you're protected against this disease in ways that might not, not actually be the case. Uh, and it leads to a lot of facial touching. And, and one of the ways in which this virus is transmitted is hands get contaminated, faces are touched by contaminated hands and people get infected in that way. So, so it's not a straightforward measure as, as you, know, you wear a face mask and, and you're protected. Uh, it's not recommended at this moment in time for general use uh, by the WHO, but we, we keep that, as I've said to you before, under constant review and we're, we're, we're keeping the question of, of use of masks in certain settings under review as part of any possible change in the restrictions that are in place at the moment. So, Great. thanks Shane. David. So David Quinn, um, so there was a, um, a disability group meeting uh, Simon Harris today, and one of the things they wanted to know was um, how many COVID-related uh, deaths have there been in disability homes? So just wondering if you have that figure, please. I don't have that figure with me right now. Um, I'll See if we can try to get you that figure yeah, for tomorrow. I, I oh, you, you come on. Yes, that, yeah. right. okay. the, we think there were approximately 10 deaths uh, overall in disability homes. Ten. Um, and I can say to you that, to the best of our knowledge, in or around 90% of disability facilities are actually free of COVID. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, next question. Um, like, obviously, nursing homes are complaining, or rather pointing out, that they are significantly down on staff. 
because of so many misunited with COVID or because they may have been in contact with somebody with COVID. Um, has any assessment been done of how many nursing home staff are missing because of this and how many need to be replaced, for example, by HSE staff, if that's possible? Um, I can't give you exact figures for, for that at the moment, but we can certainly look into getting that for you. Okay, I, yeah. I think to be fair to the HSE as well, they, they did a detailed briefing yesterday, David, where they set out, if you like, the different levels of response and colour coded them for different uh, nurse. So, I don't have that data with me now, okay. but I know it exists and the HSE will be in a position to give it to you. Okay, so if I send a question to the HSE press office, they would know how many staff are needed to go into those well, homes. The, so one thing I would say to you is that the, the response in, to the nursing home and indeed to any care facility is a very wide, detailed one. It, mm -hmm. it involves staffing, but it also involves providing a lot of expert advice as well. Sure. So we've had that in place for a good level of time and we have redeployed staff where and when necessary. Sure. Yeah. And um, just a final question, kind of a follow-up to Richard Chambers. So you were saying that there was no known cases, I think is what you said, in nursing homes as of March 10. Um, but if I'm correct, had any testing been proactively done inside nursing homes to find out if they had cases around that time? At that point, no. No. Okay. No. Thank you. No. Uh, Keenan Brennan, Irish Examiner. Um, I was wondering if you could just clear something up for me. The emergency powers that were brought in for Gardaí to uh, use at checkpoints and whatever, there was a, I was under the impression that they had expired at a certain date. They haven't? No, there was a second set of regulations with so a new date. Uh, uh, um, Signed, yeah. And so they didn't when, expire. When, is there an expiry date? So on the original those? expiry date was, was it the 11th? I, I might be incorrect. Easter Sunday, now. I think. But East, yeah, you're right. It was Easter weekend. They would have expired that weekend if, they hadn't, if a second set with the new date hadn't been signed. And what is the new date? And I just, I just don't recall as I'm sitting here, but I'll find out for you okay. tomorrow. But it's, yeah. So, there, so the, just to be clear, there is a second set of regulations. They are in force. Uh, when does the case definition change officially? So the HSE will communicate that through an algorithm to the HS to the GPs, and they're making preparations to do that this evening, um, and with a, with a view to it becoming operational tomorrow. Um, just something I've been asked a fair bit about regarding certain socially distant recreations: uh, golf, tennis, fishing, hiking. Is there any chance of restrictions being uh, lifted for certain things like that? Come May fifth. So, in terms of sporting and social activities of that nature. There is, a, I've, I've described before, if you like, a risk-based approach that we're taking to looking at all of these things. And some, some types of sporting activities will come ahead of other types of sporting activities in terms of those kinds of considerations. But uh, nothing like that I can give you a commitment on um, at this point in time for the 5th of May. We'll, we'll come back to you on that uh, towards the end of the week. Finally, and this is something Richard sort of touched upon, but just to get straight in my own head. You mentioned in the press release that improvements are necessary, but anecdotally, particularly over the weekend, uh, where I live, for instance, there was a lot of activity, close to regular activity, and at night, more activity than normal. So how can improvements be achieved when people are starting to stray from the line, as it were? Well, look, we're continuing to encourage people uh, close to where I live, seeing much the same sort of thing, to be honest. Uh, and so, we look, we're continuing to stress. Uh, we understand the, the, the patience is wearing thin. People are getting frustrated. These measures are challenging for people. Um, and, uh, uh, but we need to continue the, the commitment that we have made uh, to try and get as far as we possibly can. And while it's difficult for people, we're encouraging people as much as they possibly can to stick with the public health advice. We've done great work together as a country in terms of preventing the widespread community transmission of this virus that could have led to the kinds of scenes that we saw in many European cities and in, in North America uh, in a number of locations. We've managed to avoid that, but we could quite easily if things were to slip, uh, uh, slip back into that kind of risk. But are they slipping? Pardon? Are they slipping? Sorry. Are things slipping? As uh... so, no. I'm not saying that that's the case. We're still seeing improvement, but the rate of improvement and the extent to which we see needs to needs to. So it's slowed down a little bit in some respects. So I've said to you, if I take the measure of the number of people in intensive care units, that ha that has been dropping, but at a slower rate than it was dropping. And we need to see that drop a good deal further from where it is at the moment. And I'm just using that as one example. That, that applies to a number of the measures that I, that I set out for you earlier on. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Adam Higgins from the Irish Sun. Uh, last week, Professor Nolan told us that I think two thirds of cases have recovered. I think it was about 10,004. Has there been any cases that have been reinfected? 
Now, we've no evidence of reinfection taking place, and still the scientific community is uncertain as to whether that's something that really does or, or can happen with this disease. We have no evidence of any case of reinfection in this country. Is that a positive outlook, then? Uh, I guess it is. Uh, one of the questions that we, none of us fully knows the answer to yet is, for a person who's infected with this illness, to what extent does, does it render you immune? How long does that immunity last, and how strong is that immunity, if I can put it that way? Uh, so we still don't know the answer to some of those questions, but the assumption and the hope will be that at least some level of immunity might be conferred uh, on an individual who's infected. But bear in mind what the WHO has been saying about this in recent times, uh, we have no evidence that immunity uh, uh, will arise in a way that can protect people, and I think we have to remember that. But, uh, but as I say, we have no evidence of reinfection having occurred in this country. Thanks. Okay. Fergal Barrows, RTE News. Fergal. Can you set out for the public watching what the specific criteria are, the things that need to be uh, reached and met to allow restrictions be lifted? What are they? So we're going to do some further work on, on refining the specifics uh, of that, but they're going to be around the incidence of the disease, how many cases are occurring in the population in general, uh, how many cases are occurring in institutions and in particular community residential facilities like nursing homes and so on. It's also going to be around the impact of the disease, hospitalization numbers, the numbers of people, in other words, going into hospital, and the numbers of people in hospital at a point in time with this illness, the numbers of people going in new admissions to intensive care units, and the total number of infect, uh, uh, intensive care unit admissions at any one point in time, and then also the numbers of people uh, who die as a result of this infection. Now, that will lag a period of time behind, uh, but all of those kinds of measures are looked at. We also think it's important for us to look at how quickly there's a change in any of those. So sometimes in epidemiology, you look at things like the doubling rate, so how long it takes for the number of cases to double. Uh, so those kinds of measures are all important um, in, in, in helping us to make an assessment of where we're at at a point in time with the disease. Um, of the new cases today and the deaths, in each case, can you tell us what the percentages or the numbers uh, related to nursing homes? So of the 386, how many of those were nursing homes? You probably have the data there. Of the cases today, how many were of those new cases? Were they nursing homes? How many? So, so, oh, uh, the, oh, sorry. Uh, I don't know the precise or number in terms of... Rough percentage, of, uh, maybe? I, I do have a rough percentage. Um, I'm going, maybe, Ronan, you might have that in terms of the... So we have a number of cases that were analysed over mm. the course of, 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 of the seven-day period. So we have some data from midnight the previous Friday yeah. to yeah. midnight Friday just past. What's the percentage there? No. <clears throat> so I can give you the figures. I don't have the percentages okay. in front of me. So there was 3,836 positive cases over, over that time period, and 1,216 of those were associated with nursing homes, of which 1,077 were nursing home residents. And in terms of deaths, um, similarly. So I'll have to come back to you with the exact okay. number of deaths over that period, okay. but we've been reporting it each day. The other thing, I mean, these are, a lot of these are questions, that deep questions people are sending in to me or asking me. We give you um, the deaths in terms of nursing, I'm sorry, Fergal, yeah. just in terms of percentages overall. Yeah. So the, the 546 total deaths, which includes okay. laboratory and probables in nursing homes, accounts for 49.5% okay, of Okay, so 49%. 49% of the 1102, which is the total right. number of deaths okay. we've reported so far. Yeah. Um, you see so many, how many cases are in, in the Dublin area, people can see those maps that are published uh, by the HSC operations report. People would be wondering, would it be possible to have, well, we might need to have stronger uh, restrictions in places like Dublin, but when you look to other parts of the country where there's little or really no cases, would it be possible to have lighter restrictions there? So that's a question we've considered before. When we were introducing the restrictions, we did look closely at that question in relation to Dublin, because at that time, Dublin was accounting probably for two-thirds of the experience in the country of the illness. That's now dropped to 50%, um, and, so, and that's steadily dropped over a period of time. So at a point in time, we had two-thirds of the cases, two-thirds of the deaths, two-thirds of the hospital admissions, two-thirds of the clusters in nursing homes, and I'm approximating now with all of those, uh, in Dublin uh, or in the Dublin region. Uh, and we did give some consideration, but ultimately we, our, our assessment was that there was evidence of the disease in all of the counties in the country. They were at different stages perhaps in terms of progression, but they were all likely to progress quickly because I'll remind you that uh, in an unmitigated situation, uh, in quite a short period of time, the number of cases can jump. 
um, the number of incident cases, the number of admissions to hospital, the number of admissions to intensive care. We didn't see that there was a case to be made to be regionalizing the restrictions as has happened in other countries. We thought it was important to do all of the measures together as a whole country, all, of the, all at the same time. And at this moment in time, in how we're looking at uh, any possible change in terms of those restrictions, we don't think that regionalised differences will, will play an important part in that. Okay. In, in relation to creches, with creches closed, childcare is an issue for many people. Is it po possible to look at the relaxing the rules so that child minders could, say, be in one house looking after a number of children? I know you know your position in relation to healthcare staff and that whole childcare issue. This is a separate issue for ordinary people, I suppose, at, at home who have a child minder that a small number of children could be looked after at home? But I think again, I mean that we're, we are looking particularly at the issue of childcare, along with all of the other issues that have been discussed here this evening. But I think, you know, we're not really in a position to get into discussing any one particular set of measures at the moment. All of that needs to be considered in the light of all of the criteria that Dr. Hoonan has discussed earlier. And uh, if if one sector opens, for example, like construction, for example, and there's a lot of staff off because of construction. Would you be insisting, for example, that there'd have to be, uh, you know, the independent inspection system to ensure compliance with social distancing? Because that, that would have to be in place, wouldn't it, in tandem with any sector being open? They'd have to be inspected to make sure they're complying. Yeah, so we think the first thing with any, and, and, and without using any specific example, the first thing would be to, to ensure that people's personal behaviours, there's a high level of awareness and understanding and high level of commitment to the kinds of behaviours that will be important. And by behaviours, what I mean is the good practices around respiratory etiquette, around hand washing, around social distancing, uh, as people go back into workplaces, as people go back into society. Um, uh, and we have to have those measures in place. We have to have very clear communications and a very high level of compliance. Because as we all go back and start to mingle more than we are doing at the moment, whether that's in the workplace, whether that's in, in, in social situations, it'll be really important that we, um, we, uh, we minimize the risk of transmission of infection from one to the other, uh, from one person to another. So things that might have been the norm before, people coming to work with uh, coughs and colds, these will become no-nos in the future, if I can put it that way. It'll be like, we'll be looking at this in the future in the way we might now look at uh, somebody coming into an office and lighting up a cigarette. It, it has to become that kind of behaviour and that we reinforce one another's behaviour. If we get high standards of behaviour, then there's uh, the role for inspection and oversight. Uh, but we have to get high levels of compliance on the part of both organisations and individuals in terms of their personal behaviours. Uh, and then we will need to have uh, arrangements in place that allow us to assure ourselves collectively uh, that we're getting the kind of compliance that you're describing uh, and, and that's for the protection of the people in those workplaces and for the protection of society overall. And finally, my question really is in relation to, I wasn't here last week, but I watched it, uh, you'd seismic data up on the screen last week, which was pretty much data used to detect earthquakes um, in Ireland and elsewhere. I'm just wondering about the data behind that. I, I'm not sure, you can tell me, you can't rely on that to tell me whether someone was using a lawnmower, for example, in a house, or that they were starting their car. Some cars have to be started regularly uh, to be kept going and looked after. Uh, other people would be just driving around the block. Others would be walking short distances, all in compliance with what's needed. So you're not telling me, or I presume you're not telling Irish people that you'd be relying in any way on that seismic data as a public health data to decide yes or otherwise on lifting restrictions? Uh, it's a piece of information. Uh, indirect information that we, do, we that, that we do use, and it is telling us something. Obviously, it's, t it's not telling us that like every piece of behaviour that that relates to, and every vibration that results from behaviour is, is, is either in compliance or not. There's no way of measuring that. Of course, you're right about that. I think the, we don't have it in front of us to look at now. I have actually seen an updated version of that, which is circulating, provided by the. Uh, the, the team uh, and that produced that, uh, that very interesting information. You can clearly see uh, for a number of weeks after we introduced the third set of measures, after the stay-at-home arrangements uh, were put in place, uh, that, that, that reduced that level of vibration to a consistently low level and that over the last week, 10 days, that has increased. Uh, and that means more movement. It means more. Uh, it doesn't tell us that every single one of those is non-compliant. Of course, it doesn't tell us that. But it, it is a piece of information that's giving us, if you like, uh, harder data uh, to support the view that, it, that we're all uh, expressing. You, some of you are expressing in your own anecdotal experiences. Uh, there is more movement. There is more 
uh, activity. There is less compliant than we were perhaps seeing before. And while the majority of the population are still working really hard with us and listening to the public health advice, uh, there is a greater number of people who perhaps are doing so less so than they used to. Uh, and for the sake of everybody, we're asking that everybody really doubles down now and tries to work towards the 5th of May uh, as much as we possibly can. Thanks, Virgo. Neil. Uh, Neil Leslie, the Irish Mayor. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Yeah. Um, you've outlined some of the disease kind of parameters that you're looking at, as you say, when you go down to the wire on a decision on easing restrictions. Uh, can I just ask about the testing and contact tracing element of that package? Are you happy that that's where it will need to be to meet the threshold that on, the May, 5th, on May the 5th that might uh, lead to any easing restrictions? So it's, yeah, testing, sampling, contact tracing. There's a huge amount of work underway in the HSE to, to uh, scale that up. Um, uh, and a significant amount of extra capacity is in place now in terms of laboratories, in terms of testing. There's ongoing work to build the contact tracing capacity that we're going to need and to have us in a position to test contacts as part of the contact uh, management, if you like, uh, that we have to have in place for when uh, restrictions might, um, where it might be possible for us to, to contemplate the lifting of restrictions. What we need to do over the course of this week, uh, and which is starting tomorrow, as I've said already, is to change that case definition that will be used by GPs, which will lead to an increase, we think, in testing, an increase in the, in the, um, in the, the number of positive samples that result. All of that information will be used to, as it were, test the systems before we get to the point of assessing whether we're, we're, we are where we want to be for the 5th of May. So that work is still going on. We'll still be checking to see that it's working the way that we want before we get to the point of uh, assessing finally whether we're in a position to lift restrictions. But it won't be just those measures. It'll be our understanding of where we think we are with the disease. And as I've already said, uh, there's still quite an amount of room for improvement in that, uh, much further improvement and further reassurance that we all need in relation to the behavior of this disease before we're in a position to contemplate recommending and easing of restrictions. Okay, and uh, I just wanted to ask in terms of the psychological, mental health impact that this is having. Uh, there was one uh, uh, analysis, I don't think it was a survey, but a statement certainly by alone uh, today, for instance, in relation to the impact specifically on the elder population. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one stark fact, and it said they, they were get, receiving two to three calls a week from people in that cohort about suicidal ideation, and that's gone to three or four per day, for instance. Can you give them any hope or positivity for May the 5th that there will be something there? Well, I'm, I'm not going to comment on what the outcome of MEFIT will be on Friday, but what I will say to you is that we're incredibly conscious of the psychological impact of this on everybody, be that small babies uh, who maybe don't have their dad present at birth, uh, right up to older people who are at home on their own. And that's why we do have a number of helplines uh, and facilities available for people, both online and to contact people's GPs if you do feel very distressed. I was also talk talking to the clinical lead for the National Office of Suicide Prevention at the weekend, and they also are working very hard on this. We're extremely conscious of the psychological effects of this, and it very much weighs in on what the decisions of MEFIT will be. It's certainly a factor to be considered. Mm -hmm. yes. Thanks, Neil. Paul? Um, can I just come back to this issue of the uh, cases up around the border? Can you think of any other possible explanation for the trend there, other than there's a spillover of cases from Northern Ireland? Uh, I, don't, I, I really don't believe that the, let's say, the, the difference in incidence in some border counties compared to other border counties, the numbers are relatively speaking still small, their crude rates uh, are likely to be explained by a spillover from a higher rate of infection on one side of the border to this side of the border. I think, and we keep this under review between myself and my counterpart in Northern Ireland and the teams that work with us, including in relation to the modelling who've had close contact in recent times, to, to ask ourselves, is, is, is the experience that we're having of the disease different between the two sides of the island? And for the most part, we don't think that it is. Uh, we think that the experience that we're having here, what we've been seeing in terms of the slowing of, and albeit what I said earlier on about the numbers of people still in intensive care, they've seen similar patterns in Northern Ireland in terms of intensive care. Uh, and in terms of other measures of the disease that they use. So in broad terms, we think across the island, the experience that we're having is, 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 is similar. We're not in a dissimilar situation um, to one another. So I don't think that that's a factor. Fair enough. I don't think there's, if you look at the epidemiological map, uh, it seems to point to a different Well, you can, you, there are, the there dark are colors are all up yeah, in the you, northeast. You, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can put uh, uh, 
crude rates, if you like, at a county level and do comparisons and so on and so forth, but we don't believe that those are epidemiologically significant variations. There may be a different point because this is a disease that does cluster. You do get some regional vari variations. Uh, and that's not unusual with the disease. We've talked already about the concentration that we saw at the beginning in Dublin and to a lesser extent in Cork. Um, uh, but for the most part, um, we don't think that, let's say, that the geographical variations that we're seeing in this country are to do with a higher rate of incidence in Northern Ireland coming across the border to infect uh, uh, the, the southern part of the island uh, in the way that uh, some people have suggested. And are you comfortable with a situation whereby people can travel from Northern Ireland to holiday homes in, say, in Donegal at the weekend and can't be turned back because of the legal situation? So what we want to do is ensure that we're in a position to have every measure in, in, in as much as we possibly can operating consistently across the whole island. That's the objective of the work that we're trying to do with colleagues in Northern Ireland. There is a memorandum of understanding in, in place between uh, uh, the two departments, and in particular my counterpart and myself, to try and ensure that there's as much commonality between the, the two approaches, given the fact that, as I've, as I've said, the disease will behave in much the same way across the island, irrespective of the border. We want to try, try to ensure then that the measures that we have in place uh, are, are as consistent as possible. And finally, just um, a few nursing home owners have said to me that they believe that the cases in their homes were introduced when hospitals were cleared out as part of reducing delayed discharges. In other words, people had picked up infection unwittingly, not, not blaming anybody, in hospital, and then they were moved to nursing homes, and that's where the nucleus of those outbreaks came. Is there any evidence? Have you come across anything that might point uh, in that direction? I, I, can't, I can't say that I have that evidence. What I showed in the graph earlier on um, uh, here, which I, I think you saw, uh, is the timing. The timing was different, so the red being the rise in nursing homes. So the, clearly the rise in nursing homes took place significantly after the point at which we said stop uh, visiting nursing homes. So for the most part, visitors, bring, visitors did not bring this infection into nursing homes. Uh, but clearly it did get into nursing homes. Uh, this is a very transmissible virus, as we've said before, more transmissible in an unmitigated situation than influenza. It gets into nursing, nursing homes, therefore, more easily than influenza does. We always have a challenge with influenza in nursing homes and in people who uh, are older in the wintertime in this country. Uh, and we have high rates of infection in that particular setting. This shows, as I say, the timing of it relative to when the population itself was infected. Uh, it may well be that either uh, individuals who are going in and out of nursing homes uh, or admissions to nursing homes might have led to infection uh, in those situations. But it's a very transmissible virus, and I know this isn't the premise of your question, but it's really important for me to say that we can't be in, in a mindset of attaching blame for the spread of infection, which is a very easily transmissible infection. It has spread around the world, it has spread into these kinds of settings everywhere it's been in the world and causes significant challenge for, for those people. How it gets in, uh, is through ultimately people, because people, you know, the virus, as I've said before, the virus is not out there somewhere, it's in people, and people move and make contact with each other and spread this virus from one to the other. You've given a plausible explanation as to how that might be, uh, and there are other potential explanations that would apply, and exactly how many of those cases can be explained by that particular phenomenon, I don't have that particular information. But if a person was discharged from a hospital, uh, and there is a, and, and moved into a nursing home situation, there is a possibility. It, it involves increased mixing of people. Anything that involves increased mixing of people uh, increases the, the risk. now that before somebody is transferred from hospital to a nursing home, they have to be tested first. Is that yeah, right? that is the case. And I think it would be important to add to that, that nobody was discharged at the time when we were looking at increasing capacity in the acute system. Nobody who was discharged who was not medically fit for discharge. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, Rob O'Hanahan, Joe.ie. There was a survey released today from staff at DCU and NUI Galway that stated that the two kilometre restriction on exercise is what the first thing that people would change if they were given the choice. My question is whether this kind of public sentiment is taken into consideration when it comes to the lifting of sanctions or lifting of uh, restrictions, um, as in, or is it just purely scientific evidence that, that will decide those restrictions being lifted or not? Uh, so we take everything into account. Um, um, and that particular measure, in other words, the, the zone the, the, within which we're recommending people stay, other than for essential reasons, 
uh, that might be one of the measures that we will look at. It's not me giving you any clue as to what might happen on the 5th of May, uh, but we understand the impact that that's had. Obviously, the objective there is to try to, to reinforce the message for people to stay at home uh, and to, to limit their movements in as much as possible for the very essential reasons that we've, we've, we've provided ex exceptions. Uh, if that zone or that distance is to be increased, that's something we'll give consideration to and we'll make that clear as to whether we see any change happening now in respect of that uh, after we meet, as Siobhan has said, on, on Friday. Um, and finally, there's been um, a confirmation of 20 plus cases in a direct provision centre in the south of the country. Um, we've had the numbers given for specifically for nursing homes. My question is whether we have similar figures available for direct provision centres. We do have some figures. I can't give them to you off the top of my head, but I can also say to you that people who are in direct, pr pr direct provision, apologies, that they are able to make, they are able to make use of self-isolation facilities and so on. So we're looking at making sure that if we do have outbreaks, that people are looked after properly uh, and that they are entitled to use the self-isolation facilities and so on. And so we are making referrals when appropriate there. So referrals being made as appropriate, are those numbers available at all? I, I'm sure they are. I don't have them off the top of my head, but yes, we can get those. We can see if we can yeah. get them for tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.